Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar, this is Herbert Lynn, State Unity Life, Denver, Colorado. Mr. Lynn? I wonder if you're free to come out here and see me right away. Well, now, let me see. I hope so. What's more, I can promise you a handsome fee, in addition to your expense account, of course, whether my fears are justified or not. Fears of what, Mr. Lynn? What seems to be the trouble? A murder, Mr. Dollar. Oh? That has not yet been committed. I see, but you think will be, hmm? I must confess that I alone anticipated, or at least an attempt at it. I hope that you can somehow forestall any such attempt. Well, I can certainly try. Fine. I'll grab the first plane. The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer and the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the State Unity Life Insurance Company, Denver, Colorado office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the old-fashioned murder matter. <laughs> Expense account item one, $111.45 airfare. The first plane to make the right connections didn't pull out of Hartford until late in the afternoon, so it was close to midnight by the time we sat down at Stapleton Field on the outskirts of the mile-high city of Denver. In spite of the time of year, the mountain air was cold, crisp, and clear. It was well after midnight by the time a cab, and that's item two, six hours even, dropped me off at the famous old Brown Palace Hotel. I got myself a comfortable room and hit the sack, then first thing in the morning I dropped in on Mr. Herbert Lynn at the State Unity office in one of the big new buildings in Mile High Center. I suggest you rent a car, Mr. Dollar, because this client of ours lives in Green Mountain Falls. That's a small settlement down just west of Colorado Springs, Manitou Springs, that section. Oh, I know the place well, Mr. Lynn. Oh, do you? Mm-hmm. Back in the summer of, uh, 58, I spent a couple of weeks fishing out of Lucky Four Ranch with my old pal, Ray Schmizny. Uh, Ray, what did you say? <laughs> Schmizny. Believe it or not, that name's a lot easier to say than to spell. I'm sure it is. Now, this client's name is Howard Hartzell. Yes? He's 73 years old, Mr. Dollar, and at one time was quite wealthy which explains his insurance policy for nearly a quarter of a million dollars. And you think somebody wants to murder him? Yes, I could almost say I'm certain of it. Who, Mr. Lynn, and why? One or all three of his beneficiaries, or at least two of them. Want to tell me who they are? Well, to begin with, Clara Johnson, a niece. School teacher in Colorado Springs. Forty-five, I'd say. And about as mean, selfish, and grasping an old maid as I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. When she found out about her uncle's insurance policy... She immediately wanted to know why she wasn't made the sole beneficiary. Mr. Hartzell had quite a time with her. Now, what does Clara teach? High school chemistry. Now, then there's another niece, Bonnie. She's young, smart, good-looking, married to a plumber by the name of Harry Briggs, also lives in Colorado Springs. They have no children and uh, manage to make a living of sorts. Now, you have the addresses of these people? Yes, right here. I've listed them on a slip of paper for you. Here you are. Good. Thank you. And finally, as you see, there's Tony Johnson, a nephew. In uh, Manitou Springs, it says here. Yes. Tony inherited quite a bit of money from his own family. and Went through it in less than a year. You know, big parties, expensive cars and girls and so on. And he's now working as a bartender in some cheap saloon there in Manitou Springs. Lazy, no good, wasteful, Dollar. In other words, if something does happen in your book, he'll be number one suspect. Yes, and I pride myself in having a sort of instinct in such matters. Which of the two girls, the nieces, would you put next? Well, if there were any reason to suspect anyone else, I should say Clara. I'm sure that when you see Bonnie and talk to her, you'll realize that she couldn't even think in terms of murder. <laughs> What's that? Oh, excuse the chuckle, I suppose if... All the stuff you read in detective stories means anything, then Bonnie is the one I should suspect. Didn't you hear me, sir? If only because she apparently is above suspicion. You'll see for yourself. But suspect of what? Has there been any actual attempt to murder Mr. Hartzell? Twice, Mr. Hartzell was narrowly missed by a car that bore down on him as he was crossing the highway in front of his place. Mr. Lynn, you're talking about Route 24 mm -hmm. that cuts through Ute Pass there at Green Mountain Falls? I am. Good grief, as I remember the traffic on that main highway. Howard Hartzell is absolutely certain that each time the car tried to run down, and it was the same car each time. Well... Then, early one morning, a small-caliber bullet plunged through the window of his living room, 
Missed him by only a couple of feet. Might be a careless hunter. Then there was a mysterious fire at his home. In the middle of the night, Dollar. If a passing motorist hadn't seen it... Even so. And Mr. Hartzell was confined with bed at the time. He wouldn't have stood a chance. Incidentally, there's another thing. What's that, sir? His health recently. After all, I believe you did say he was 73. But up until recently, as healthy a specimen as you could... Why, if I'm in as good shape when I reach that age as he is, or rather was... What's been the trouble? I tell you, Dollar, that whatever's ailed him has been too all-fired mysterious. Hasn't he had a doctor? That's another thing. That ancient family doctor of his, Dr. Easterday. What about him? Well, if you ask me, his name ought to be Yesterday. <laughs> he should have quit practice 20 years ago. But he's the only one that Hartzell will have. Matter of fact, Doc Easterday is living there with him now. To protect Hartzell, he says. Oh? Yes, and I suppose I must give the old pill pusher credit for that anyway. How do you mean? Well, I'm not the only one who feels that Hartzell's life is in danger. That those things that have happened weren't accidental. Now, that fire didn't come from any greasy rags. Is that what the fire department said? Yes, but I don't believe it. Tell me, is Mr. Hartzell sick right now? Well, right now he's on the mend from this last attack of, well, whatever it is. Liver ailments, says old Easterday. I think he was poisoned. Hmm. Have these nieces and the nephew been to see him recently? Not since the doc moved in there, believe me. And that's been a couple of months now. He's allowed them absolutely no contact whatever with his uncle. Well, if they've had no contact with him, how could they poison him? That's what you've got to find out, Dollar. And find out which one and bring him to justice. Him, you say? Of course. It has to be that no-account nephew, Tony. But just because there's no reason to suspect her, I suppose you'll go to work on Bonnie. Mr. Lynn, I think you're making a couple of mountains or two out of a molehill. Oh, you do. But as long as I'm here, I'll uh, look in on these folks you've mentioned. I remember one thing, Dollar. If I'm right, if, and I'm sure I am... Well? Whoever would plan to the murder of the uncle would be only too glad to get you out of the way. Mr. Lynn had given me a good idea, possibly a dangerous one. It was simply to make no bones about who I was, why I'd come out here, why I wanted to see and talk with them. The nieces and nephew, I mean. Then, if one of them did try to make a fast move, get me out of the picture, I'd be on guard. It was a pretty sure way of knowing who was up to something. Item three, a dollar ninety-five worth of phone calls to tell the relatives and the old man that I was on my way to... Item four, fifty bucks deposit on a rental car. I'd like to have stopped off at the uh, U.S. Mint there in Denver, one of the largest in the country, to see if they were handing out any free samples, but instead I headed south on 87, past the big new Air Force Academy into Colorado Springs. Clara Johnson, the older niece, lived in a tiny three- or four-room house badly in need of repair on a side street off Cascade Avenue. Fortunately, for uh, pretty obvious reasons, the interview was a short one. That's ridiculous. That's all utterly ridiculous. Now, Miss Johnson... I mean that Uncle Howard, the old fool, should have included those other two in his will, in his insurance. Positively indecent. Well, tell me, does your uncle have much of an estate besides the insurance? No, not anymore. But do you know how much that insurance is? I have a pretty good idea. Nearly $250,000. And do you know what that would mean to me? To me, who's worked and struggled along all these years alone. I could give up this miserable teaching of those nasty, unappreciative brats of the high school. I could travel, go abroad, enjoy myself for a change, the way I deserve to after all these years. Now, don't you think that Tony and Bonnie... Oh, look at Bonnie. She has that young husband to take care of her, give her everything she wants, or at least most everything. And she's pretty. She has a nice figure and... And do you think that that Tony deserves anything? Miss Johnson. After the way he went through the fortune that his father left him. He does not. Well, nonetheless... The keeper, that's what he is. And always getting into scrapes for those... Those gangsters that hang around that dive where he works. It's disgusting. Miss Johnson. I'm the one who deserves that money. All of it. Clara. If only that old miser would die before it's too late. Before I get too old. <laughs> but he keeps on living just to spite me. Too bad you can't help him along, then, isn't it? Well, I don't think I don't wish I could, Mr. Dollar. Believe me, if I could find some way to... to... Oh, 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 no, 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 I, I didn't mean that. Didn't you? Uh, no, no, I, I shouldn't have said such a well, thing. Well, I'm afraid you did. Thanks very much, oh, Miss Johnson. Uh, now, wait. I didn't mean that the way it sounded. Bye. 
My next stop along the way was at Harry Briggs Plumbing Shop. Bonnie was there holding down the store while her husband was out on the job, and she was pretty. Although it always kind of stops me a little when I see a girl working on her makeup over a business desk. And I was so glad when you phoned to say that you're here to kind of look out for Uncle Howard. Oh, oh, I called Tony and told him you'd be seeing him, too. Here. I look better now? Oh, you look like a million. Well, thanks, Johnny. Gee, you're cute for a private eye. Oh, thank you, ma'am. No derby, no cigar in the corner of your mouth. Just a real good-looking guy. <laughs> Only I shouldn't talk like that, should I? Well, I'm afraid flattery will get you nowhere. <laughs> oh, darn. Um, tell me, did you mean that you two have been worried about your uncle? Well, of course, after those cars that almost killed him and that fire at the posterior of his house and the sicknesses he's been having one after the other. Oh, I'm sure that Dr. Easterday is doing all he can for him, but... Much as Harry needs me around here, business isn't too good these days, and I feel I ought to be out there taking care of Uncle Howard, nursing him. It isn't as if I didn't know how. Would he have you? No. No, he wouldn't, Johnny. I'm afraid he thinks that all Clara and Tony and I keep hoping is that he'll die and leave us that insurance. And isn't that true? Should I lie and say no? Of course, we'll be glad to get that money, all of us, at the proper time. Completely forthright and frank, and I must admit I was well impressed. Maybe Herbert Lynn was a good judge of character. He was certainly right about Tony there in the cheap bar and grill over in Manitou Springs. This was a character I didn't like immediately. Short, thin, hair plastered down with nervous hands and shifty eyes set close together. As we stood there behind the bar talking, with Tony claiming only undying affection for poor Uncle Howard, another man came in and stood by, as though waiting for Tony's signal to rough me up. Yeah, Mr. Lynn was right, all right. I wouldn't have trusted Tony as far as I could throw the Empire State Building. Sure, Dollar. You can figure some way to knock off the old man. Well, I know three of us would be glad to cut you in on that nice, fat hunk of insurance. What good is he living out the rest of his days? Sick half the time. Maybe you'd like to help him along, hmm? You think I wouldn't, wise guy, if I thought I could get away with it? Don't pull any boo-boos, Tony. Don't worry, buddy. I'm too smart. Or all talk. Hey, Tony, give me a gun. Hey, hey, look, I got to get ready for the afternoon train, huh? Go ahead. Maybe I'll see you later. Sure. Any old time. The usual, Eddie? The important thing now was to see Mr. Hartzell and the old family doctor at Green Mountain Falls. I walked around to the back of the saloon, got into my car, then turned on the ignition. But in that brief moment before the starter took hold, I heard a buzzing under the hood, a sound that I knew only too well. That car had been wired. I jumped out and ran almost too late. the smoke cleared away from the carefully set explosion, I was blocks away at another car rental agency. I knew that Tony would be even further away, if, that is, he was the one who planted the bomb. So item six is another $50 deposit on another rental job. I sped up to Green Mountain Falls then to keep the date I'd promised over the phone. In answer to my knock on the small two-story home there on the side of a mountain... Mr. Dollar? That's right. Mr. Hartzell? No, I'm, uh, I'm Dr. Estaday, and thank heaven you've got here. Oh? Albeit, I'm afraid you're too late. You mean something's happened to him? Howard Hartzell is dead. When? Just a few moments ago. Would you like to come in? Yes, I think I'd better. We can uh, we can sit here in this combination living bedroom of mine. Unless you wish to see him. But there's really no point in it. How did he die, Doctor? It was a severe case of toxic jaundice. Oh, jaundice? Yes, this uh, hemolytic jaundice... A uh, liver condition has been bothering him for quite some uh, just time. Just one moment, Doctor. Yes. Well, Mr. Dow. In spite of your uh, rather fancy medical terms, something has just rung a bell. I can't quite tie it down. You're sure 
That jaundice is what killed him? Mr. Dollar, after all, I've been practicing medicine some 50 years. Well, maybe that's good, and maybe it's bad. I beg your pardon. When I was out here before on a vacation, I had an infected finger. Well, I failed to see what... Now, the doctor who treated me was a young fellow by the name of, um... Ed Wilson. Where's your phone? What young Dr. Ed Wilson had to tell me was more than a little interesting. That's right, Johnny. Administered at repeated intervals, even minute quantities of arsenic compounds may produce a subacute type of poisoning. Go on, Ed. Well, the victim may develop a toxic uh, degeneration of the liver. It may progress to an acute or subacute yellow atrophy that's accompanied by an intense toxic jaundice. I see. And that, in turn, can be followed by severe, even deadly, gastroenteritis. And is that sort of poisoning something that might fool an old-time doctor who hasn't kept up with modern developments in medicine? Uh, Johnny, I wouldn't want to go so far as to... Uh, what is all this, anyway? Thanks, Ed. Thanks a lot. Do you mind telling me what that was all about, young man? Doctor, I want you to have an autopsy made immediately. But there was a physician in attendance at his death. I myself, it isn't necessary. Doctor, will you please order the autopsy? Well, very well, if you insist. The result? Arsenic poisoning beyond the least shadow of a doubt. But then came the real problem. How and when was it given to him? More important, how it was given to him in small doses over a long period of time and by whom? I, Mr. Dollar? Well, apparently you're the only one who's been with him all this time. What, you think that I might... Oh, that's ridiculous. Well, I hope so, Doctor. He said, yet. Yes? Well? Well, I, I suppose I can't blame you for wondering about me. Ever since I began to worry about him and he began to suspect his relatives of planning his death, I've permitted no one else to see him. As you can see, I have my uh, room and bath here on the first floor. His are on the second. And there is no way anyone could have gotten to him up there without my knowing about it. You always ate the same food he did? Always, and I prepared it myself. The only time uh, during his waking hours when I wasn't with him, watching over him, was when he was in the privacy of his little bathroom up there. Mm -hmm. And yet somehow... Did Clara ever uh, come here to see him? No, no, no. As I told you, ever since I've been here... How about Tony? Well, Tony hasn't been here since the day he... And even then, I didn't let him in the door. Since the last time he delivered a, a bottle of whiskey. Whiskey? Uh, uh, yes. In the beginning, I uh, I had Mr. Hartzell take a small quantity of it each night as a, as a stimulant. Well, all right, then. Well, that was stopped months ago. Oh. Where's the rest of the whiskey? Oh, I'm afraid... I drank it myself. Oh, well, then that's out. Now, how about Bonnie? Well, I told you, Mr. Dollar. Yes, you told me. Uh, even her husband, when he came to fix the plumbing in the basement. Oh? Uh, that was two months ago. Yes? Even he wasn't permitted inside the house proper. I see. Hmm. You say you did the cooking? Uh, right? Yes. Who brought him the groceries? I did all the shopping myself. No one could possibly have contaminated them. And I myself ate them. And while you were out shopping? The house was locked, and Mr. Hartzell let no one in. You're sure of that? Absolutely. Because during the past month or so, he was upstairs, unable to come down here. Yet somehow, somebody... Wait a minute. Oh, yes. Posterior. A fire in the posterior of this house. What? What? That's the way it was told to me, and that's what's going to tie up this case. I'm afraid I don't Not understand. the back of the house, Doctor, but the posterior. Uh? That's what you would have said. You, a doctor. So would a nurse, and a nurse would know all about arsenic, too. Well, of course, but I told don't... me that she ought to have been here taking care of him, nursing him, that she knew how. Of course, she'd been a nurse. Mr. Dollar. And her husband is a plumber. Come on, Doctor, let's see if we can find the green telltale that arsenic would leave up there in his bathroom, say, around the nozzle of a water spigot. <laughs> And that's exactly where we found it. And downstairs in the cellar, hidden behind a furnace pipe and hooked up to that cold water line, not the line to the kitchen or the bathroom on the first floor, but hooked up to the line to the second floor was that ingenious, deadly device, a small container half full of an arsenic solution with a valve so that only a drop at a time would enter the pipe that gave Mr. Hartzell his drinking water, the one drop at a time that killed him. Funny. It wasn't the sweet, gentle Bonnie who finally broke down and confessed their little plot, but her husband, the plumber who'd rigged the device, who'd also rigged my car for that explosion. So, once more, it's up to the courts. 
My only regret is that worthless Tony and selfish Clara will share that nice hunk of insurance. Expense account total, including the trip home, three forty seven eighty five. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr., musical supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also heard in our cast were Leora Thatcher as Clara, Lawson Zerby as Dr. Easterday, Patsy Campbell as Bonnie, John Seymour as Herbert Lynn, Richard Holland as Tony, and William Lipton as Dr. Ed Wilson. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Alan Burns speaking. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.